From the time Adolf Hitler rose to power to become Reich Chancellor of Germany to his death in April of 1945, there were multiple attempts from his enemies to take his life. As World War II progressed and Germany's odds of winning the war continued dropping, more assassination attempts on the life of the Fuhrer would occur. In July of 1944, there would be an assassination attempt on the life of Adolf Hitler, the closest anyone had gotten to ever eliminating the Nazi leader before his death by suicide on April 30th, 1945. Codenamed Operation Valkyrie, the plan was to use the approximate 2 million men of Germany's replacement army to take control of Germany once Hitler was killed. Along with Hitler, the resistance planned to assassinate Chief of the Luftwaffe and President of the Reichstag, Hermann Göring, and Chief of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. This was to be sure they weren't promoted to Hitler's position of Führer when he was assassinated. The individuals in the resistance ranged in ideology, some even being communists. The reasons they wanted to assassinate Hitler also varied from person to person. However, what they agreed upon was that the war needed to end immediately and after Hitler was killed, a new government would be formed. This would be the only way to create peace and possibly save Germany. Welcome to another episode of Storytime with Artie, Operation Valkyrie. Germany 1944 the Germans are losing the war. In February of 1943, Germany faced a major setback, losing the Battle of Stalingrad. The Germans lost 250,000 soldiers in that conflict and suffered a major mental defeat. From nearly capturing Moscow in late 1941 to now being pushed out of the Soviet Union, the Germans were now calculating the possibility of losing the war, something unimaginable even two years prior. For the Germans, the defeat at Stalingrad started their country's rapid plunge. On May 13, 1943, Germany surrendered in North Africa, leaving the continent for good. In July of 1943, the Allies invaded the southern city of Italy, called Sicily, in a quest to take down the leader of the country and Hitler's main ally, Benito Mussolini. Within 38 days, the Allies captured the city of Sicily and moved to take all of Italy. On September 8, 1943, Italy officially surrendered, exiting World War II. The Allies now only had to defeat Germany in Europe. On June 6, 1944, the Allies landed in Normandy, France, closing in on Hitler in Germany's capital city of Berlin. The Allies were coming from every direction, and Germany losing the war seemed inevitable. Throughout 1943 and 1944, there were five different assassination attempts on the life of Adolf Hitler by a secret opposition group. Before Hitler's secret police, more well known as the Gestapo, would finally eradicate this group of antagonists, one final assassination attempt would be made. The head of the opposition, Lieutenant Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, would personally carry out the mission. Failing the mission meant certain death, but the country's future was worth the risk. Klaus von Stauffenberg was born on November 15, 1907 in Jettingen, Bavaria. Before Hitler gained absolute power, Klaus supported the idea of Hitler becoming the Fuhrer, believing it would unite the country. The idea of Fuhrer principle, the fight against corruption, the fight against the spirit of the large urban cities, the racial thought, and the will towards a new German-formed legal order, appears to us healthy and auspicious, he would say. However, as the years progressed, his view on Hitler and the Nazi ideology would shift. Klaus proudly took part in the invasion of Poland, which marked the start of World War II. In October of 1939, a month into the Nazi invasion of Poland, Klaus made this note, It is essential that we begin a systematic colonization in Poland, but I have no fear that this will not occur. 
1941, Klaus was transferred to the department directing the German invasion of the Soviet Union. It was here that his view of Hitler and the regime would take a major turn. During the invasion, Klaus saw firsthand the brutality of the war and the unbelievable treatment of the Jews. He would openly express his outrage and shock to fellow officers. He told Major Joachim Kuhn in August of 1942, they are shooting Jews in masses. These crimes must not be allowed to continue. Unable to cope with the horrors in the East, Klaus asked to be transferred to the campaign in North Africa. On April 7, 1943, Klaus was in a vehicle driving to a station in North Africa when Allied planes took aim at his motor vehicle. He survived the attack but had major injuries. For three months, he was placed in a hospital in Munich. He had lost his left eye, complete right hand, and two fingers from his left hand. Years later, his son would say about the incident, You know, wounds were so commonplace at the time, and having lost an arm, having lost an eye, was quite normal. It was really a relief that he was alive. In September of 1943, Klaus was propositioned by conspirators to join a plan to assassinate Hitler, and he agreed. Later that year, he would be the main man in charge of the operation. Speaking about his father, his son would say he was disenchanted with Hitler's strategic capabilities and that really Hitler was a different type of person from what we thought acceptable. His son would also say they were not sure they would succeed, but General Treskow said the attack on Hitler must go on, if only to prove that not all Germans were his followers. After the Allies landed on Normandy on June 6, 1944, Klaus knew the war was lost. Only an immediate peace agreement would stop more unnecessary deaths and possibly save Germany. The days leading up to the assassination plot. July 1, 1944, Stauffenberg is appointed the Chief of Staff of the German Replacement Army. This allows him access to top meetings in which Adolf Hitler is present. July 3, 1944, Berchtesdagen, Bavaria. Klaus travels to the town of Berchtesdagen and meets fellow conspirator Major General Helmuth Seif. Helmuth hands Klaus two bombs with a silent fuse, small enough to fit in a briefcase. July 14, 1944, The Wolf's Lair, East Prussia, early afternoon. Klaus attends a meeting in Hitler's military headquarters called the Wolf Slayer. Wolf was a self-described nickname Hitler had given himself. With him, Klaus carried a briefcase. However, chief of the SS Heinrich Himmler was not present, so Klaus held off on the assassination attempt. July 15, 1944, the Wolf Slayer. Klaus once again is carrying his briefcase. When he walks into the meeting, he's delighted. All three targets are in attendance, Adolf Hitler, Hermann Göring, and Heinrich Himmler. He believes this is the opportunity to complete the mission. Unfortunately, at the last moment, Hitler is called out of the meeting due to an emergency. Luckily, Klaus is able to recover the briefcase without anyone finding out what is inside. Once again, the assassination attempt is postponed. July 16, 1944, Klaus is informed by a co-conspirator that the battle in Normandy was looking grim for the Germans. Hitler was going to hold another meeting four days later on July 20th. Due to the rapidly deteriorating position of the Germans in the war, the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler had to be implemented immediately, regardless of whether Göring and Himmler were present. The final date was set, July 20th, 1944. There was no more time to lose. Hitler had to be killed. July 20th, 1944, 12.30 p.m., The Wolf Slayer. Klaus had hoped the military meeting would take place in the underground bunker normally used for such meetings. The bunker's heavy steel door that would be sealed shut to the windowless concrete room would increase the damage of the bomb, causing casualties for anyone inside the room. However, July 20th in East Prussia was incredibly hot. The meeting was moved to a wooden bunker above ground. This room had plenty of windows, meaning the blast wouldn't be as powerful. Place two bombs near Hitler, however, and it wouldn't matter. 
Unfortunately, when Klaus arrives, he realizes that neither Hermann Göring nor Heinrich Himmler are present out of the 24 people. Still, Hitler's chair was there in the middle of the room. After Hitler was killed, the resistance would deal with Göring, Himmler, and the rest of the high command accordingly. For now, only the assassination of Adolf Hitler was of importance. Klaus excuses himself to the restroom. With him, he carries his briefcase, which has two bombs inside. These bombs need to be quickly armed before the meeting starts. As Klaus wraps up arming the first bomb, a guard knocks on the restroom door, informing Klaus that the Führer is ready and the meeting is about to begin. Having run out of time, Klaus can't arm the second bomb. Still, if placed in the right area, the one bomb by itself would kill Hitler. Klaus exits the restroom. Using the excuse of having bad hearing due to the injuries he obtained in North Africa, Klaus is given a seat close to Hitler. Only one person sits between them. Klaus places the briefcase down as close to Hitler as possible. After a few minutes, Klaus excuses himself due to a pre-arranged phone call. Once he leaves the room, he waits. However, after Klaus left the room, his seat was taken by Colonel Heinz Brandt. To make more space for himself, Brandt naturally moves the briefcase behind the solid table leg. July 20th, 1944, 12.42 p.m., The Wolf's Lair. As Hitler is leaning over the solid oak table, examining a map, the briefcase detonates. One man dies instantly, and three officers would later die from their injuries. 20 people in the room are injured. Years later, General Walter Wallemont, who was in attendance in the meeting, would recall the explosion. When the bomb went off, I just had this feeling that a big chandelier had fallen on my head. I went down. I saw Hitler was led out of the room, supported on the arm of Keitel, and my first impression was that he was not injured at all, or at least not seriously. In fact, Hitler had gotten very lucky. Had Colonel Brandt not moved the briefcase behind the solid leg of the table, Hitler would have probably been dead. Hitler suffered only minor scrapes and a busted eardrum. His pants were also ripped to shreds. Miles away by then, Klaus von Stauffenberg and his aide believe Hitler is dead. They drive past three checkpoints without issue and enter the Rosenberg airfield. By 1 p.m., they are airborne headed to Berlin. July 20th, 1944, 4 p.m., Berlin, Germany. Stauffenberg's plane lands in Berlin. Believing Hitler was dead, the reserve army had already started their coup, arresting high officials in the Nazi party. However, within a few hours, they realized the horrifying truth of the situation. Hitler was alive and vengeful. Their plan to overthrow the government had failed. Death was imminent. July 21st, 1944, Banderblock, Berlin, 1 a.m. Klaus von Stauffenberg and three of his co-conspirators are placed in line to be killed by a firing squad. Klaus is third in line to be executed, with the last person being his aide, Lieutenant von Haften. However, after the first two conspirators are killed, and it's Klaus's turn to be put to death, Lieutenant von Haften jumps in front of Klaus and takes the bullets for him. For the firing squad, nothing has changed. Being the final man left, Klaus yells out, Long live sacred Germany, before his executioners fill his body with bullets. The next day, Klaus's body is taken by the SS, stripped of all medals, and cremated. The man who had gotten closest to assassinating Adolf Hitler was dead. August 10th, 1944, the People's Court, Germany. Berthold von Stauffenberg, the eldest brother of Klaus, is found guilty of conspiracy and sentenced to death. Along with seven others, he's tortured before his murder. A video camera is set up showing Berthold being strangulated and revived multiple times before his death. This video is given to Hitler to watch for his enjoyment. 
The assassination attempt would start a purge in Germany with 20,000 people who were in opposition to Hitler being killed. But as General Treskow had said, the July 20th plot showed the world that not all Germans were followers of Hitler. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel. I'll see you guys next time for another episode.